Midnight runs the best new movie in years, says the San Francisco Chronicle. A non-stop belly full of laughs, says Jeffrey Lyons. I can't do this! De Niro and Groden are terrific. And Roger Ebert calls it completely original, a real surprise. Groden is better than Eddie Murphy. And for me, that's, that's good. This better be good. This is very good. One word? One word and you're dead. Fabulous. Midnight Run. Rated R. Now playing at theaters everywhere. Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around is my review of the 1988 comedy action flick Midnight Run. Now, Midnight Run is one of those films that when it came out, it got nothing but high praise from the majority of well-known mainstream critics. And over the years, it has garnered a well-deserved cult following. And I do enjoy the film. I think it's a fun movie. It's got a great cast. And there are a lot of elements about this film that I really find to be quite noteworthy and remarkable. But I got to be honest. There's something about this film that makes it not really live up to its full potential. It's one of those films where it's almost as if there's too much of a good thing. Like the screenwriter put in everything but the kitchen sink in here. And a lot of the people involved with the production felt like every bit, everything was so good that it had to be kept in. And had to just be precisely the way it was on the page. And I think that there could have been some moments here that could have been trimmed some sequences that could have been left out. And I think as a whole, that would have helped the film because there's no reason for this movie to be two hours. It's a very simple, straightforward plot and it's spread out a little too thin in the second and third acts for me. And when it comes to the comedy, there are some memorable moments that definitely do make you laugh. Like a lot of the banter between De Niro and Grodin, the whole moment where Grodin, his character, the Duke, is on the plane and he's talking about how these things go down. These things go down. It's too big. Like, that's hilarious. And I love the interactions between De Niro and Grodin and how Grodin's character is just constantly needling and poking at, at, uh, De Niro and then you have those moments where De Niro snaps like a like an alligator or a shark and tells him to shut the fuck up like it's it's really a lot of fun and there's some other moments of dialogue that made me chuckle like how to the point Dennis Farina's character is and, and how he's talking about all these different things that he's going to do to his henchmen if they don't get the job done so there's a lot here in terms of potential for a really funny movie but i don't know what it is like there are a lot of moments here where i'm i'm just like eh, okay that was fun that was fine but nothing like laugh out loud funny and when it comes to the action it's not really uh, a landmark in that area either. Uh, there's a couple okay chase scenes. There's a exciting sequence where Robert De Niro shoots down a helicopter. But the action, when it is there, is just kind of run-of-the-mill. And when you compare it to something like Beverly Hills Cop, or even Beverly Hills Cop 2, or other action or other comedy action films, it doesn't really stand up to those films. It doesn't really hold its own against those kind of movies. So it's a good film, and I really do get a fair amount of enjoyment out of it, but the big part, the reason why I do enjoy it and why I do like the film is mainly for De Niro and Grodin. It's for those two. And 
the writing is fine, but I think the way that the plot unfolds is a little too predictable at times. And it's one of those movies where I think your mileage will vary. I think a lot of people are going to find it to be like really great, really enjoyable and so on and so forth. And I, and I gotta be honest, when I first saw this film, I really loved it when I saw it on VHS, but rewatching it, I just felt it dragged a little too much at times. And I felt there were a lot, there were a lot of things that could have been enhanced a little more or, fleshed out or left out entirely so it's directed by martin brest and according to everyone involved with this film who has been willing to be interviewed martin was really uh meticulous to say the least when it comes to uh, his direction and that's a big reason why the direction is so good but it's also a big reason why there are some cast members who are saying things like it was a really rough shoot. Like Yafit Koto, I think there's an interview where he's talking about how it was a really rough shoot because of how meticulous uh, of a director Martin Brest was. One of those guys who wants you, or he is, uh, but it's just one of those directors that wants you to do multiple takes in order to get it just right. And there's a certain point where that gets a little excessive and it seems like from what I've been reading there were quite a few moments like that that the film was no longer this really fun atmosphere for everyone involved it became a little oppressive and even the director was starting to feel uh, the effects of the pressure and just the 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 grueling shoot of it all i mean six months they shot this film for six months that's that's half a year that they spent shooting this movie um and the direction it's not as dynamic as Martin's direction in Beverly Hills Cop. That's another thing. Like it's it's a well directed film. It's got some good direction. I wouldn't call it great direction though. Uh, in particular, a lot of the action sequences don't really have the same punch as as his directing in in Beverly Hills Cop. And I find that interesting because this came out in '88, and it wasn't that far removed from his work in in that film. Um, but it's, it's, it's still a nice example of directing. And I think Martin Brest did do a good job. It's just one of those things where I wouldn't really call it an example of great directing. It was good, but I, but I wouldn't say it's great. And I feel the same way about George Gallo's script. I know a lot of people, they say it's brilliant. It's great. It's nearly flawless. And I don't really feel that way because there's the twists and turns are not really anything that's really going to throw you for that much of a loop uh, other than some revelations from some of the characters. So the way things unfold is, is unfortunately a little predictable and uh that's a big reason why the pacing suffers in the second and third acts in particular. Um, and it's also one of those films where, like I said, it feels like the screenplay could have used another voice, another writer in the room to punch up some more of the dialogue, to, to add in some things, to, to make things a little more intriguing, a little more dynamic overall. Uh, I know a lot of people like the the stuff with Yafit Koto, and Yafit Koto is a great actor, and it was fun to see him in a role like this, but it, the, the repeated gag didn't really do that much for me with the whole where, I'm Alonzo! It's like, okay, I get it, but I just it just really didn't really do that much for me personally. I didn't find it funny, uh, I just found it moderately amusing at times. And that's kind of how I feel about a good amount of the comedy in this, other than some really great uh, moments of back and forth 
in terms of the dialogue with De Niro and Grodin. Um, De Niro getting fed up with uh, Charles Grodin's character and how she... And how Charles Charles Gordon's character is talking about all these different phobias he suffers from. And he's like, you're going to suffer from fistophobia if you don't stay still. <laughs> if you don't cooperate. Uh, th that was fun. And I really like the scene where they're in the train car. And Charles Grodin uh, improvises. And he does his rendition of what a conversation with, with De Niro's character would be like. That was hilarious. And then he talks about how the chickens were starting to look good and that was a fun scene and that actually was all Charles that was all Charles improvising the entire sequence uh so was the scene in the bar where Charles Grodin's character is coming up with a, a plan to get some money and uh, that was um mostly improvised by Charles as well and that's a big reason why Charles wound up getting the role is because of the fact that he had uh, a lot of experience with improvisation. And uh, it seems like the producers and the writers, they were looking for that. But what's interesting about Charles Grodin and his involvement in this film, which ultimately would be one of his really uh, big roles in his career, like arguably his most standout role if you think about it even though he had done a lot of stuff prior to this this was the one that really for a lot of people cemented him as uh much more than just your average character actor as someone who could hold their own uh on the screen with someone as intense and someone as strong as uh, robert de niro and he initially was not the one that the studio wanted. Uh, Paramount was the one that was behind the film initially. And they were trying to go for big names at the time. They were actually considering having Cher be the one opposite Robert De Niro. Because Robert De Niro was going to be in it no matter what. Uh, he signed the contract on the dotted line. He was going to be in it. Uh, but a lot of people weren't really fans of the idea of Cher, understandably so. But the studio was really like, we want to do the Cher thing. And even De Niro was starting to be like, I, I, I like Charles Grodin. And I think it might be one of those things where De Niro was like, I'll, I'll fucking walk if you don't, if you, if you try to bring Cher into this movie and make this a Cher film. Um, I don't know why Paramount thought that Cher was going to be the big star that this film needed to be a hit. I don't understand that at all. Uh, and because they couldn't come to an agreement, uh, ultimately it was put into turnaround and then it was bought by Universal and they're the ones that went ahead with it and they decided to stick with Charles Grodin. It started to go with Charles because De Niro went to bat for him and what's interesting about other casting ideas for a uh, Grodin's character in this film the Duke is you had names like Robin Williams Robin Williams apparently was given a script and it, from what I've been reading it seems like he really wanted to do it but for whatever reason that it decided not to go in that direction and as much as I would have loved to have seen De Niro work alongside Robin Williams, uh, I'm glad that Charles got the role because it did help Charles become an actor that people appreciated in the mainstream. Uh, as a guy who can go toe to toe with De Niro or actors like De Niro and he had done some stuff in the past that you could say okay you you'd shown that he could do that but not to this extent and Charles himself has said in interviews that this is his favorite film that he's done and you can tell that he was just so passionate about this performance and this character and he put his heart and soul into it and 
a lot of his own idiosyncrasies and, and things like that are also present in this character. And so much of this character, the Duke, is Charles Grodin that I don't think this film would work as well as it does when it does if you had a different actor in that role. The same goes for uh, De Niro because Jack Walsh is such a different kind of role for De Niro, especially at the time. This is arguably his first comedy and he nailed it. And it also tapped into a lot of De Niro's own personality traits and his own quirks. So both these characters have these two actors DNA all throughout. And it just makes these two characters ones that really do have an impact and have the impact that they do thanks to the actors that bring them to life. And it's just a great cast overall. I mean, it's not, you not only have Robert De Niro as Jack Walsh and uh, Charles Grodin as uh, Jonathan Mardukas. You've got Yaffa Koto as Alonzo Mosley. You've got John Ashton as Marvin Dorfler. I love John Ashton in this. The running gag. Oh, hey, Marvin, watch out. <laughs> like, like that, that was, that was pretty funny. Um, and John Ashton was just, just a blast playing this role uh dennis farina played a great villain and jimmy serrano uh joe ponsigliano is eddie moscone a really good douchebag the kind of guy who's just an asshole who you can't trust who double crosses you and it was so satisfying to see him get uh nothing but uh fuck you from uh, the Duke and Jack at the end of the film. And there are other members of the cast, but that's really the main cast. That's the main players. And the main players all play off each other well and have good chemistry. Uh, that's a big thing about this film is that De Niro and, and Grodin are, are just such a perfect pair in this they're so on top of their game and there are other elements of this film that are noteworthy and, and worthwhile too like danny elfman's score even though danny elfman's score in this at times is not the best it's still a decent enough score especially for a composer like danny elfman this score is so different from the norm when it comes to danny's usual fare that it's one of those things where if you did not know ahead of time that this was a score that was composed by Danny Elfman you would not know there's no way that you would know because it's so different compared to what his normal style is and there are some moments with this score where he really cooks and he really delivers the main theme. I love the main theme for this film. There are some other moments though, where you can tell he's in, in the deep end and he's not comfortable and it's kind of awkward. And there are some moments with the score where it's a little too repetitive, but I still think it's a pretty decent score, especially for Danny Elfman who this is not really the kind of music that's in his wheelhouse. So it shows that he's capable of doing this kind of music and doing at least an above average job. So that's what makes it kind of frustrating that now later in his career, you don't really see a lot of music that he does for films that has that different dynamic to it. That shows that he has more range as a composer. And it's well shot by Donald E. Thorin, the, the cinematographer. Uh, there's some really gorgeous shots of, of different landscapes while they're going cross-country, like in Arizona. Um, you also have uh, some nice editing by the trio of Chris uh, Lebenzon and Michael Tronick and Billy Weber. But yeah, like I said, the running time, it's it's too long. I don't think this film needed to be two hours 
for me, it did drag at times. I know it doesn't for others. And uh, I think that's fantastic. I, initially, I felt the same way when I first saw it, but I didn't feel that way the most recent watch. Um, but it's still one of those films that just captures the spirit of a lot of different people involved so well. And one of them is definitely the late, great Charles Grodin. Um, this is the film, this is the performance that I would point out to people to showcase the entire range of Charles's talent as an actor. And uh, he definitely was a special actor and a special person. Uh, from a lot of interviews that I've seen, a lot of things that I've read about Charles, he was a very well-natured, very well-read man who just had an unbelievable knack for manic roles and for comedy and, and for quick wit and just some of the best deadpan in the business. So Charles will most definitely be missed, but his spirit 100% lives on in films like Midnight Run. And I don't really know what else to say about Midnight Run other than I want to share some thoughts on this Blu-ray from uh, Second Sight uh, because this was sent to me as a gift by a longtime subscriber of mine uh, years ago. So I wanted to share my thoughts on uh, the features here. Uh, this ports over... Well, this is, this is the original source for a lot of the features from the recent, uh, fairly recent... Uh, release from uh Chow factory uh this has the interview with charles grodin uh it's only 12 minutes it's very short more than half of it is charles talking about things that have nothing to do with the movie which is too bad but at the same time charles he was such a well-read man that he could talk about the phone book for however long he chose to and he would make it interesting and make it worth watching so when he whenever he went off topic it, it still was something that was fairly captivating to me because charles was just so good at speaking and and being articulate and the little bits that he shared were nice because he talked about how much the film meant to him and he talked about how it's his favorite film and his favorite role. And it was just nice to see him. Uh, and then you have an interview with Joe Pontigliano and that one was okay. A lot of it was introspective, him talking about his life and his career and not a whole lot about Midnight Run except that his agent thought that there wasn't really much for him with this film and the original idea that the producers had for the character of uh, Moscone was uh, different than what Joe Pontigliano was going to bring to the table. They were looking for a different body type, for instance, but uh, Joe auditioned and blew them away and he won them over. Uh, the, the best interview to me, though, is the one with John Ashton. Uh, John Ashton was so passionate, so charismatic in this interview. Hilarious. He's talking about uh, the, the times that he spent with Robert De Niro while they were getting prepared for their roles in this film, where they actually hung out with a real bounty hunter. And he's talking about how the bounty hunter, like every other word out of his mouth was fuck. And uh, he talked about how funny that was and how Bob and him chose to incorporate so much, so much F bombs into the film because of this guy. But at the same time, they thought that he was a bit much. So they set up a fuck meter <laughs> And the fuck meter was based on the guy in the beginning of Beverly Hills Cop where he talks to Eddie Murphy's character, Axel Foley, and he tells him, you know, uh, take the two fucking, uh, two fucking grand. And, 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 uh, 
Robert De Niro and John Ashton, they were like, if a scene in the script or if a moment in Midnight Run uh, seems like it has too many F-bombs, they would compare it to that scene. They'd be like, that scene would be fine if it was just take the two fucking grand or take the fucking two grand, but not the, not the take the fucking two fucking grand. That's too many fucks. I love I love that. It was great. And another thing that was really fun about well not necessarily fun but really nice to see about with this interview is how vulnerable and open John was at one point where he talked about uh why he became an actor and he was very emotional and he connected with me on a, a level that I did not expect where he got tearful and choked up and he was talking about how he became an actor because he wanted to help people find a way to escape from reality. And I thought that the way that he said it and the way that he uh, composed his words was just so compelling. And uh, I, I would recommend trying to track down that interview just, just for that bit alone. Then there's also a little short seven minute audio interview with uh, Yavik Kodo and he talks about how he jumped at the chance to do this film because he rarely ever got uh, comedies. Like he was never given comedies that often to, to star in because that just wasn't something that a lot of people saw him being uh, right for. And he expressed how he just loved the, the opportunity to play a different kind of role. And then he talked about how uh, revolutionary the character was in terms of the way that it was an African-American who was portrayed in this kind of fashion. And he was an FBI agent and he wasn't just the butt of a joke, although to, to be honest, he kind of was, but, but I said, but I see what he was trying to go for there and he talked about how much fun he had on the film despite the fact that it was a demanding production because of martin breast's uh uh attention to detail and then there's like an original uh midnight run uh promotional featurette from back in the day uh this does not have the 2k remaster that's on the more recent shout factory release and it doesn't have the little interview with robert de niro but what i heard is the interview with robert de niro is not much of it at all it's like some weird mix of clips from back in the day with narration and then like one little bit with de niro so that sounds like a massive letdown but i i would still like to get the the shout factory release someday because it does have a new remaster and it that's really the main reason for it. But for right now, I'm, I'm still okay with this. But keep in mind, if you do decide to get this release, it, it's not the 2K remaster, so it's not as good of a remaster, and it is region locked. So if you don't have a region free player, this will not play. But one thing I also really love about this release is, is this cover. I love this cover art. This is, this is a fantastic poster. Um, and I think this is the best poster for this film. So, uh, yeah, I really got no nothing else to say about, uh, midnight run, except, uh, it was a fun time. It was, it was a fun, uh, film to watch again. And, and it was a nice film to see, to appreciate the genuine talent, uh, of, uh, Charles Grodin. And, um, uh, just like uh, the film itself says at one point in time, see you in the next life, Charles.